an introduction to 3D beamforming. In a previous video entitled A Detailed Introduction to Beamforming, we concentrated our attention on arrays where the radiation elements lay on a straight line and the inter-element distance is constant. As the radiation patterns are symmetric around the array axis, their properties may be completely described by a two-dimensional representation on a plane including that axis. In this video, we will address a more powerful antenna technology based on arrays where the radiating elements are distributed on a rectangular surface. This is the preferred implementation on 5G mobile communication systems. As we will see, these arrays steer their beams in the three-dimensional space, providing additional benefits. We will start our presentation describing the evolution of base station antenna systems from collinear to massive MIMO arrays. In a further step, we will introduce the essential concept of 3D path difference. Moving on, we will compute the signal received at an arbitrary point from one element of the rectangular array. Initially, we will obtain a rather complex mathematical expression, but some manipulations will provide significant simplifications. The end result will be an algebraic expression called the array factor that encapsulates the full description of a rectangular antenna array pattern. Armed with this toolbox, we will design the antenna array to steer its radiating energy in a given direction. We will briefly discuss some standard methods used to represent three-dimensional radiation patterns on a bidimensional surface. And we will apply these visualization tools to investigate the three-dimensional radiation fields created by collinear arrays. We will observe that rectangular arrays provide additional freedom to steer the electromagnetic field on the desired target. In the final section, we will compute the distribution of received power on the vicinity of a 5G mobile station. Base station antenna arrays. A very simple transmitter may be represented by a sinusoidal oscillator connected to a couple of collinear conductive rods. Linked to a suitable modulator, this elementary transmitter is able to send messages to a remote receiver. The simple antenna is called a dipole. To be efficient, our antenna should radiate most of the energy received from its source. A dipole fulfilling this requirement can be built using two quarter wavelength rods. You may remember from a previous video that 5G networks may be designed to operate at centimeter or millimeter waves. At 3.5 GHz, for example, the wavelength is 8.6 cm. Therefore, a half wavelength dipole for this band will be rather short, just around 4 cm total length. The power flux distribution in a given direction is called radiated power density. It is measured in watts per square meter. Using the electromagnetic theory, it may be demonstrated that the energy radiated by a dipole reaches its maximum on the plane perpendicular to the antenna axis at its midpoint. Besides, the points laying on the antenna axis receive minimum power. Quantitatively, the radiated power density dependency on the elevation angle theta is given by the expressions displayed on the screen. These graphs show that the radiated power density changes significantly with the given direction, reaching its maximum as theta equal to pi over 2 radians, 90 degrees. No energy is radiated in the z direction. In other words, the radiated energy is concentrated on the orthogonal plane and in this sense the antenna shows directivity. Note that it is common practice to represent the radiated power density in polar coordinates. A simple radio communications link may be built using one transmitter and one receiver, each of them equipped with a dipole antenna. 
If both antennas are set on parallel directions, maximum energy transfer takes place. It is, in this sense, the ideal setup. If, on the other hand, emitter and receiver antennas are orthogonal, energy transfer is poor, theoretically null. The reason why energy transfer depends on the relative positions of these transmitting and receiving antennas lays on the way they radiate and capture electromagnetic waves. We say that dipoles generate polarized waves. Although not perfectly precise, we also used to say that the antennas are polarized. Polarization may be used to provide, at some extent, two simultaneously and independent communication paths between transmitter and receiver on the same radio channel. This is a useful approach, as it doubles the data rate if both receivers belong to the same mobile phone. This mechanism, called polarization multiplexing, is extensively used in 4G and 5G cellular radio. Let's have a look at its practical implementation. One of the base station emitters is connected to a pair of cross-polarized dipoles aligned, for example, at minus 45 degrees to the left of the vertical line. The second base station emitter is connected to a couple of dipoles at plus 45 degrees to the right of the vertical line. A similar arrangement may be used at the reception side to complete the system. We may stack several cross-polarized dipoles on a vertical straight line, the resulting structure being called linear array. You may recall from a previous video that a linear array concentrates its radiating energy on a given direction, a capability called beamforming. In that video, we analyzed the radiation pattern on a plane including the array axis. Linear arrays have been used since the first generation of cellular communications. Each array covers one cell. The figure at the right of the screen presents this antenna in a schematic way, where each cross-polarized dipole is represented by a small yellow sphere. In a typical cellular site, the surrounding area is covered by three cells, each one spanning a 120 degrees sector. The site includes three arrays, each one transmitting and receiving the radio signals from one sector. As each cross-polarized antenna element can support two simultaneous data streams, this operation mode is known as multiple input, multiple output 2x2, two two, abbreviated as MIMO 2x2. Two two. More formally, this approach is described in the standards as 2x2 two two special multiplexing. MIMO 2x2 two two was standardized by 3GPP for 3G WCDMA cellular communications as an optional feature, but it really entered the market when its implementation at base station on mobile phones was declared mandatory in 4G LTE systems. In the never-ending quest to answer the demand of higher data rates, Carriers have started to replace single column by two column arrays. This antenna setup makes possible to transmit up to four simultaneous radio streams, a method called 4x4 MIMO. In 5G, the 3GPP new radio standard includes the possibility to deploy rectangular arrays with a large number of columns and rows. These arrays may support the simultaneous transmission and reception of many radio streams, a mechanism usually known as massive MIMO. In this video, we will concentrate our attention on the design principles of these rectangular arrays. Before closing this section on cellular antenna systems, we should stress that quite often, obstacles exist on the straight line joining emitter and receiver. In this case, radio waves may be reflected on walls, vehicles, and other objects. Waves also show the capability to turn around obstacles at some extent. This phenomenon, called diffraction, was initially observed on light in the 17th century. Reflection and diffraction generate electromagnetic waves with arbitrary polarization angles, 
limiting the decoupling efficiency reachable between orthogonally polarized antenna couples. At some extent, Special purpose signal processing at transmitter and receiver sites can attenuate this problem. This is the domain of the so called precoding techniques. We will not delve in this very interesting topic during this video, but hope to come back to it in the future. For the time being, let's just say that it is at the core of 5G technology and remains a rich research field. In summary, 3G and 4G antennas are based on linear or dual inline arrays enabling up to two or four simultaneous radio streams, respectively. In 5G, rectangular arrays become the preferred option. Orthogonal polarization enables two simultaneous communication flows using the same radio channel. Reflection and diffraction of radio waves traveling from transmitter to receiver reduce the theoretical polarization decoupling efficiency. Special purpose signal processing precoding can, at some extent, compensate the decoupling losses due to reflection and diffraction effects. 3D path difference. The arrays of cross polarized dipoles are a possible and simple implementation, but in practice antenna designers may use other antenna elements corresponding to better trade-offs between technical and cost constraints. To simplify our physical analysis, we will focus our attention on arrays composed of elements radiating equally in all directions, called isotropic for this reason. They are represented in the figure by small red circles. As we will see later on, if we understand how an isotropic elements array works, it is easy to deduce how an array based on arbitrary type elements behaves. We will restrict our study to the case where the elements are evenly distributed in the x and y directions. In other words, consecutive columns are separated by the same distance dx and consecutive rows are separated by the same distance dy. In the technical literature, this structure is called a uniform rectangular array. Our array includes capital M columns and capital N rows. Let's call 1 1 the bottom left element. The element located in the intersection of column P with row Q is called PQ, and the top right element is called capital M, capital N. To complete our scaffold, let's draw a Z axis perpendicular to the array plane. If UX, UY, and UZ are the unit length vectors corresponding to the directions of the X, Y, and Z axis respectively, R can be expressed as the addition of its three Cartesian projections. Suppose that D11 is the distance between element 11 and point P. DPQ is the distance between an arbitrary element PQ of the array and P. As said previously, we will restrict our calculations to the case where these distances are much longer than the array height and width. Let T11 be the time needed by an electromagnetic wave to travel from element 11 to P. Let TPQ be the time required by an electromagnetic wave to travel from element PQ to P. Note that for the point P depicted in this figure, T11 is slightly longer than TPQ. Let's call tau this time difference. In a similar way, let's call D the difference between distances D11 and DPQ. Tau may be calculated as D over C. We represent the direction from 11 to P by a unit length vector called R. If UX, UY, and UZ are the unit length vectors corresponding to the direction of the X, Y, and Z axis respectively, R can be expressed as the addition of its three Cartesian projections. 
In 3D calculations, it is practical to consider two particular angles, the one between the z-axis and r, called zeta, and the other between the x-axis and the r projection on the x-y plane, called phi. Using trigonometry, we may express the r Cartesian components using theta and phi. The vector rpq, linking elements one one and pq may be expressed using ux and uy as states in the figure. We are interested to compute the projection of rpq on the line holding r. It is the length difference between the distance that a wave originated at one one and another originated at pq would need to travel in order to reach p. We call it path difference and represent it as delta al pq. You may recall from vector algebra that this path difference may be computed as the scalar product of vectors rpq and r. You might also remember that the scalar product of two vectors is simply the addition of the products from their respective Cartesian coordinates. Recalling the previous expressions of rx and ry, we may express the path difference in terms of theta and phi. In summary, rectangular arrays holding evenly separated elements are called uniform rectangular arrays or A in the technical literature. They are frequently adopted in the design of 5G antennas. URA mathematical modeling starts by considering observation points located far enough from the array to consider that wavefronts originated from each array element are parallel to each other when reaching the observation point. It is convenient to adopt polar coordinates phi theta to represent three-dimensional directions. A simple mathematical expression provides the path difference between waves originated at any two array elements arriving at a distant point P. Signal received from an array element. Let's call S11 the signal received at P from a wave originated at element 11. In a radio communication system, electromagnetic waves are used to carry messages from the emitter to the receiver. The message may be included in the amplitude M of a sinusoidal waveform oscillating at an angular frequency omega zero. Cosine of omega zero t is called the carrier, and m of t is called the amplitude modulation. Note that the message may be conveyed on the carrier frequency or in the phase. For simplicity, we will not deal with these modulations here, but the conclusions on arrays reached from amplitude modulation apply as well to them. In the situation depicted in the figure, element 11 is located farther from P than the other elements of the array. If all elements radiate a pulse at the same time, waves from any element PQ arrive a certain time in advance than waves from 11. Let's call tau PQ the time difference. The delay tau PQ affects both modulation and carrier. We will restrict our attention to radio systems where M changes at a much slower rate than the carrier. So we can approximate M of T plus tau PQ simply as M of T. This assumption applies to practical 5G systems. In electrical engineering, complex numbers provide a convenient method to simplify notation. For this reason, it is useful to write SPQ as the real part of a complex number. To make notation even easier, engineers take for granted the real part operator, dropping it from the equations. It remains implicit. In the same line of thought, the exponential term e raised to j omega zero t representing the carrier is dropped as well. Following these notation simplifications, what is left as representation of spq of t is called the complex envelope in some texts or the phasor in others. The array factor. 
we call angular frequency omega zero the magnitude representing two pi times the wave's frequency. In 1861, James Clerk Maxwell observed that the frequency of an electromagnetic wave may be computed as the ratio between the speed of light and its wavelength. So, the angular frequency may be expressed as a function of the wavelength. In a previous section, we have computed the time difference tau pq of a generic element from the array as the ratio between the path difference and the speed of light. Combining both expressions, we can write the product of omega zero and tau pq in a compact form. The modulated signal received at p from the radiating element pq may be written as shown in the figure. We can now bring into consideration the path different expression calculated in a previous section of this video. This path difference may be used to write the exponent of the modulated signal received at p from element pq. It may be slightly rearranged as shown in the figure. Suppose that the same modulated carrier is applied to all array elements. The signal s dot received at p will be the addition of the contributions from each array element. To implement beamforming, we choose to multiply the signal assigned to each element by a specific factor called weight. If these factors are complex numbers, we can control the amplitude and phase of the signal applied to each array element. As we will see later, suitable weight values allow to steer the radiation towards a target direction. With this modification, the signal received at point P from element PQ is shown on the screen. Note the presence of the WPQ factor. The signal received at P resulting from the contributions of all radiating elements is S dot. In a practical case, antenna elements are not isotropic. They are characterized by a specific radiation pattern that may be precisely measured in the laboratory. It may be demonstrated that the received signal in this practical case is the product of the antenna element pattern times the signal that could be received if isotropic elements would be used. So in general, the signal received at point P equals the modulating signal M of T multiplied by two factors, one that exclusively depends on the antenna element properties. We call it the element factor. Another one that exclusively depends of the array properties, such as the number of elements per row, per column, etc. We call it the array factor. Beam steering. In 5G, we call transmission beam forming the physical mechanism allowing the base station to concentrate its radiating energy in the direction of the mobile receiver. A similar mechanism makes possible to focus the base station sensitivity on a given direction. This is called reception beamforming. Recall from the previous section the expression of the array factor AF. Let's call U the product of sine theta with cosine phi and b the product of sine theta with sine phi. Using these two auxiliary variables we obtain a more compact expression. Suppose that we want to steer the array radiation in the direction represented by the angles theta s and phi s. As previously, we defined two auxiliary variables us and vs related to these steering angles. Using these intermediate variables, we select the wave to be applied at each radiating element using the expression given in the figure. At first view, this selection may look quite arbitrary, but we will see that it leads to interesting results. When these specific weights are applied to each element, a new expression of the array factor is obtained. Let's call it capital S. Inside the double summation, we notice a factor depending only on P and another on Q. Both have the same form. 
if we extract the p dependent factor the double summation becomes the product of two single index ones both factors have the same format the left one depends only on x on the right one on y we call them array factor x as x and array factor y as y in the next section we will find their physical interpretation Using these expressions, the rectangular array factor becomes a product of Sx and Sy. By definition, Sx is a summation, but with some manipulations, we will see that it may be expressed in a more compact and convenient form. For this purpose, let's start defining an auxiliary variable, Psi-X. Replacing Psi-X in the array factor Sx, we know that it looks like a simple progression. In the particular case that u equals us, sx reduces to capital M. On the other hand, if u differs from us, we know that each summation component equals the previous one multiplied by e raised to j psi. More formally, we can affirm that sx is a geometric progression of ratio r. Since the epoch of the ancient Egyptians, we know about a formula allowing to compute the sum of a geometric progression. It is highlighted in green. Deducing this formula using modern algebra is not difficult, but we will take it for granted. For future work, it is more convenient to multiply by minus 1, numerator and denominator. We can make further progress in our simplification quest by remembering that the sign of a number z may be expressed as the complex expression highlighted in green. This can be easily deduced from Euler's formula written at the right of the screen. With a little manipulation, this sign definition may be written in a slightly different form that is more suitable to use in the expression previously deduced of Sx. This formula leads to an expression for the sine of z over 2. Allowing to express e raised to jz as a function of z over 2. Applying the yellow expression to the blue one allows to write sx as a sine quotient. Further simplifications lead us to a very compact form. To obtain a compact expression for sy, we proceed in a similar way as for a 6. Firstly, we define an auxiliary variable, psi y, leading to a geometric progression of ratio e raised to j psi y. Summing up this progression, we obtain a compact expression for s y. In summary, to steer the beam in the phi s theta s direction, the weights to be applied at each array element may be computed according to the signal flow displayed in the image. To summarize, the signal received from a uniform rectangular array is the product of the element factor and the array factor. The rectangular array factor is the product of the array factors in the x and y directions. Factors in each direction may be expressed as simple quotients of sinusoidal functions. Applying specific weights to each array element makes possible to steer the radiation, be informing. Weight for each element may be computed using a simple algorithm. Three-dimension visualizations 3D visualizations are different ways of representing the three-dimension radiation patterns on a plane. To illustrate these concepts, consider the simplest array, including just four elements. We would like to plot the array factor for all possible directions. An arbitrary selected radiation direction may be represented by a unitary vector displayed in green on the figure. Its orthogonal projection on the array xy plane makes an angle phi with the x-axis. The unitary vector makes an angle theta with the z-axis orthogonal to the array plane. One visualization approach consists in representing phi on the x-axis, the abscissa, and theta 
on the y-axis the ordinate. We call this representation the theta phi visualization. The array factor corresponding to each phi theta pair is represented by a rainbow color. Low values are in blue and high ones in red. As you may remember from a previous section, the maximum array factor equals the number of elements per column times the number of elements per row. In this example, this maximum is 4. In another visualization type, we paint the array factor corresponding to each 3D direction on the surface of a sphere placed at the array center. In order to comply with the fair field restriction, we select the sphere radius to be much longer than the maximum dimension of the antenna array. We have chosen 300 wavelengths in this example. To represent the array factor, we use the same rainbow convention previously described. In summary, we may represent the 3D behavior of a uniform rectangular array using either the phi theta or the spherical representations. Alternative visualizations may be found in the antenna textbooks. 3D patterns of linear arrays. Let's summarize the calculation approach previously developed. Suppose that we want to evaluate the array factor corresponding to a direction represented by the angles phi and theta. We call it the observation direction. Let phi s and theta s represent the desired steering direction. Ways for this purpose are calculated using the algorithm previously developed. Firstly, we compute the auxiliary variables u, v, us, and vs. Then we compute the auxiliary variables psi x and psi y. Assume m rows in the x direction and m columns in the y direction. Using these variables, we compute the array factor components as x and as y. We obtain the array factor multiplying as x with as y. Consider the particular case where all array elements are located on the x axis. This is what we have called a uniform linear array in a previous video. As capital N equals 1 in this case, S Y equals 1 as well. So the total array factor S reduces to S X. Recall from a previous section that S X was at that time stated just as an algebraic variable. It can now be assigned a physical interpretation. S X is the array factor corresponding to the first row of the uniform rectangular array. Besides, consider the other particular case where all array elements are located on the y-axis. As capital M equals 1 in this case, S X equals 1 as well. So the total array factor S reduces to S Y. We can now give a physical interpretation of S Y. S Y is the array factor corresponding to the first column of the uniform rectangular array. This figure shows the spherical visualization of a two elements uniform linear array laying on the x axis. For the moment, we have assigned null values to phi s and theta s, meaning that the desired steering direction points in the z axis. Note that the pattern shows a revolution symmetry around the array axis. Observe as well that the plane orthogonal to the array at its center is a plane of symmetry. If we increase the number of array elements from 2 to 8, the previous symmetries are still present. For 8 elements, the high intensity region on the sphere is now concentrated in a narrow band while this region for two elements remains diffuse and low. In conclusion, increasing the number of array elements leads to higher directivity. The same conclusions may be reached using the phi theta visualization. If the linear array lays on the y direction, a similar behavior is observed. In summary, a linear array provides the most basic beamforming alternative. Linear arrays are the building blocks of rectangular arrays. 
linear array radiation patterns present high intensity bands. The high intensity band becomes narrower as the number of elements increases. 3D patterns of rectangular arrays. In the 3D radiation pattern of a rectangular array, we observe an approximately circular high intensity region. Therefore, the rectangular array is able to concentrate its radiated energy on a smaller area than the linear array. We say that it provides a smaller footprint. Increasing the number of array elements has two consequences. First, the array factor increases everywhere on the whole sphere. Second, the size of the high intensity footprint becomes smaller. The array focusing capability improves. The additional gain and enhanced radiation concentration capability leads to significant performance improvements in 5G systems. As higher intensity signals become available everywhere, mobile phones located on the cell border or inside buildings, previously out of coverage, become reachable. In addition, users located in cell areas subject to low propagation losses may be served at higher data throughput and fewer retransmissions may be expected. As previously said, the improved focusing capability reduces the size of the high strength signal footprint. Therefore, mobile phones located in the target's neighborhood are exposed to less interference. The base station may use this improvement to provide acceptable service quality to a higher number of users. In other words, 5G beamforming may be used to increase the cell traffic capacity. This animation shows how the array gain grows when the number of elements of a uniform rectangular array increases from 1x1 one one to 8x8. Eight eight. The maximum radiation intensity of a rectangular array may be steered to a desired direction. In 5G systems, this direction corresponds to the location of the target mobile phone. These figures refer to an 8x8 array. The theta steering angle changes from 15 to 90 degrees, while the phi steering angle stays at 0 degree. Note that for steering angles theta s near to 90 degrees, the footprint becomes larger and distorted. In other words, the array progressively loses its focusing capability at these high steering angles. This animation shows the steering capability of an 8x8 array when zeta steering and phi steering increase from 0 to 90 in steps of 5 degrees. Note that the format of the high intensity region becomes increasingly distorted as the steering angle grazes the array plane. The following is a phi theta animation corresponding to the same trajectory. Note how this visualization strongly distorts the polar region corresponding to low theta values. This is just an artifact resulting from mapping polar coordinates on a Cartesian xy plane. The distortion resulting from high steering angles is also apparent in this figure, where theta steering stays at 0 degrees while phi steering increases from 0 to 75 degrees. Received power dependency on distance. 
As a final application of the arrays theory, we will consider the received power distribution in the neighborhood of a target mobile station when the sail base station antenna is a uniform rectangular array. We will consider at the base station side an array of 64 elements distributed on a square matrix of 8 columns in 8 rows. The distance between consecutive array elements is half a wavelength. We suppose that elements show an isotropic pattern, meaning that they radiate equally in all directions. Conduction losses in the antenna feeders are neglected. There is no vertical tilt, and the total power of 32 watts is evenly distributed among the antenna elements, providing 500 milliwatts to each one. For simplicity, we assume no obstacles interposed in the wave path and no reflections existing on nearby objects. This is called line of sight propagation in the technical literature. In these conditions, the ratio between received and transmitted power is given by the so-called freeze equation. The ratio between transmitted and received powers is called propagation loss. As we are supposing omnidirectional radiating elements, GT and GR equal 1. No conduction losses implies L equal to 1 as well. For a typical 5G radio link at 3.5 GHz, the wavelength is 8.6 cm. At a distance of 10,000 wavelength, for example, the received power from a single element is approximately minus 75 dBm. Suppose a rectangular observation window centered on the target and laying on a plane parallel to the array. Call D the distance between array and observation planes. Consider a square observation window measuring 300 wavelengths on each side. At 3.5 GHz, this window is approximately 26 by 26 meters. This figure shows the received power distribution on the observation window when placed at 51 meters from the transmitter. The target is at the center of the window. Note that the received power around the target changes significantly between the center and the border of the observation window. If the observation window is placed at a distance of 86 meters, two consequences become apparent. First, the red color from the central region is replaced by orange and yellow, corresponding to lower levels. In other words, the received power falls significantly on the whole observation window. Second, the variability range on the window becomes smaller than at 51 meters. In other words, the received power on the observation window is more homogeneously spread. Consider finally the observation window placed at 800 meters, typically the distance from a suburban base station to its soil border. In this case, the received power falls strongly and no power differences on the observation window are perceived. This graphing table provides a quantitative perspective on the dependency between received power and base mobile distance. The difference between maximum and minimum powers on the observation window falls as the distance between transmitter and receiver grows. For short distances, the differential range is high, but it steadily falls as the distance increases. At around 2500 wavelengths, corresponding in this example to 200 meters, this difference is already below 1 dB. The following animation shows the evolution of the received power pattern. In conclusion, the power received at the mobile station falls steadily as its distance to the base increases. 
In line of sight conditions, the freeze equation predicts a power loss proportional to the square of the distance. At relatively short distances, the reset power near the target changes significantly, while at long distances, this differential range becomes insignificant. Conclusions a typical 5G base station antenna is a rectangular array of cross-polarized elements. Given a desired steering direction, a simple algorithm provides the weight to be applied at each antenna element in order to concentrate the radiation emission and sensitivity on the target. The array factor on any 3D direction may be computed as the product of two linear array factors. The array factor calculated in this way applies to omnidirectional antenna elements. But in practical cases, the antenna element radiation pattern is not omnidirectional. For this case, the array factor is the product of the antenna element factor and the array factor computed if the elements could be omnidirectional. The high energy region of a linear array is a 3D band. Its width decreases as the number of elements grows. The high energy region of a rectangular array is approximately circular. Its diameter decreases as the number of elements grows. As the steering direction approaches the array plane, the array focusing capability degrades. Thanks for watching. Thank you.